Hello and welcome. Um, thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm Anil Padavatan. I'm the Health Programs Officer at GATE. And GATE is an international advocacy organization working towards justice and equality for the trans, gender diverse and intersex communities. And GATE also hosts an international community-led working group which is focused on strengthening and generating knowledge to promote the greater inclusion of trans men and trans masculine persons in the international HIV response. And in collaboration with the trans men and HIV working group, we have developed a policy brief and fact sheet on the inclusion of trans men and trans masculine persons in HIV programming and funding, um, which is what we are launching today. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us. The theme for World AIDS Day this year is Let Communities Lead. And so we're particularly proud to be launching a resource that was developed by the community to address the unmet needs of trans men and trans masculine persons. We are a vulnerable group who's historically been ignored and excluded from the global HIV response. And we're hoping that this policy brief and fact sheet will make a lasting contribution to greater inclusion. So I'm joined today by a very powerful panel of speakers. We've got Clayton Eusebio de Lima, who is providing our opening address, and then Sam and Globo and Seb Rowland, who are our panelists. And I'm just going to introduce them very quickly. Um, Clayton is Senior Advisor, um, Civil Society Networking at UNAIDS. He's an international development professional with more than 12 years of experience in developing and implementing programs on public health and human rights, with a special focus on HIV prevention, treatment and care for key populations, including LGBTQI plus communities. Thanks so much for joining us, Clayton. We're also joined by Sam Ndlogu, who is the chairperson of the Southern African Trans Forum and executive director of TREAT, a trans rights organization based in Zimbabwe. He is a member of the Trans Men and HIV Working Group and he also works as a consultant on grassroots community organizing and models of work. And it's not in the official bio, but Sam is also an amazing poet and performer and welcome Sam. Um, and we have Seb Rowlands, um, who is an independent consultant. In fact, the consultant um, who developed the policy brief and fact sheet, um, who has been working on projects across LGBTQI rights, HIV, sexual and reproductive health rights and global health for over 10 years. Most recently, they have been working with Transgender Europe on resources and training to support trans activists and organizations to counter the anti-gender movement. And their previous work with GATE includes developing a training course on HIV community-led monitoring. They are also a member of the Trans Men and HIV Working Group, and we're really glad to have you with us today, Seb. And we're also grateful to all of you, the participants who've joined us today. We're looking forward to hearing your questions and comments. We have a Q&A function today, um, and we are going to be having a questions and answer session right at the end. But please feel free as we go along to put your questions and comments in the Q&A. And I'm going to hand over now to Clayton for the opening address. Over to you, Clayton. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anil. And uh, thank you, Gate, for inviting me. It's really a great, I feel honored to be invited to speak on this webinar and the launch of this important uh, publication that we will have today. Uh, I'm proud to speak on behalf of UNAIDS that and we just launched, really, literally like one hour ago, we just launched the UNAIDS World AIDS Day report with the team let communities lead. So I will bring some of the messages of the report for, for us to share here today. Uh, unfortunately, when we see the, the global HIV statistics, we still see a lot of gaps and challenges. We still had uh, last year, uh, one, one, one person died for eight, from AIDS related illness uh, every minute. And we had more than 1.3 million people uh, became newly infected with HIV. We still have nine, more than 9 million people that are not accessing uh, HIV treatment yet. Next slide, please. And when we look to key populations, we still see that they are the populations that has uh, much higher uh, HIV prevalence, 
uh, affecting these populations than the adult population. And I will just highlight the data on transgender uh, persons. We have the most recent data from UNH showing that the globally, the median HIV prevalence among transgender persons is uh, above 10%. And this is based on data from 32 countries reporting to UNAIDS, but unfortunately only four countries includes data disaggregated for transgender men. And these four countries are Mali, Netherlands, uh, Ukraine, and United States. Next slide. So we have this lack of data. This is an important issue that uh, the global AIDS response needs to address, uh, this lack of data uh, about uh, on transgender population, but especially about uh, transgender men. So we had a, a, recently in June, we have a meeting of the UNAIDS board where we discuss it, the challenges affecting transgender people and other key populations. And just highlighting a few, uh, a few of the field data that we have, uh, only three countries reported uh, recent uh, uh, antihetroviral coverage of transgender people living with HIV, uh, Indonesia, uh, India, and Nigeria. And only Nigeria uh, disaggregated and reported data for both transgender women and transgender men, showing transgender men, transgender women have slightly higher coverage than transgender men of uh, treatment coverage. So the report of the thematic segment highlights that there are particular gaps around data on transgender men who are marginalize it uh, in the HIV response. Next slide. So we have this report launched today that really shows the main message is showing that the HIV response, the AIDS response can only succeed if communities lead. And it shows that uh, communities play a critical role in connecting people with HIV services, in reaching those communities most affected by HIV, and providing HIV and support services. It also shows how community advocacy in all in many regions are, are has secured groundbreak, groundbreaking changes in policy uh, for key populations, for example. And it shows that communities, as some countries think they are not, they are not in the way, but they are really lighting the way to the end of the HIV, of, of the AIDS response, of the AIDS. Uh, epidemic. Next slide, please. So the report will show that while community leadership is a huge asset for the HIV response, unfortunately, it's still under-resourced, under-supported, and in many places, communities have been attacked today. Next slide, please. And some of the barriers to community leadership that the, the report will highlight is the how harmful laws and policies, discrimination and violence affecting key populations, including transgender people, but the community is trying to reach them with HIV services under threat. We also, the report also show how, shows how underfunding of community-led responses is leaving them the organizations is struggling to be able to continue to operate and holding them back from expansion. Next slide, please. So in a few messages, what, what the, this report that it's a, in one hand, it's a celebration of the role of communities, but at the same time is a call for countries and donors to support community-led responses. It is calling for community leadership roles to be made core in all HIV plans and programs. Community leadership roles to be fully and reliable funded and barriers to community leadership roles should be removed. And I think as, as Anil said in the beginning, I think this is what we are seeing today with the launch of this report is really a concrete example of why communities need to be supported and need to have more funds to take the leadership of the AIDS response. I would like to congratulate Gate 
and the Trans Men and HIV Working Group for the launch of this publication. And we would like to put UNAIDS to continue partner and to, to think about solutions on how we can make sure that trans, trans men are really and meaningfully included in the HIV response. Many thanks. Thanks so much, Clayton. Um, and, and that's really, I think, has given us a really good jumping off point to then hand over to members of the working group um, who were involved in the project. And I'm first going to ask Sam, if you could please just give us some background and some context. How are trans men impacted by the HIV epidemic in Southern Africa? Okay. Um, so uh, basically in Southern Africa, um, what you will find, uh, I'll just take an example, perhaps looking at our country, which has uh, a that a lot of similarities with a lot of our neighboring countries in the region, whereby they first came across um, the population of transgender persons and um, the level of risk was assessed through a biobehavioral study, the first one that was carried out in the country. And this, in, in this study, um, they came across uh, trans women. So basically, this is how we ended up at a situation where trans women were embedded within a response uh, for MSM. And from there, this is where the conversation started around transgender persons uh, being uh, included in terms of the HIV response. However, what then happened was because of uh, perhaps the setting in which uh, trans women were then discovered in terms of their levels of risk, um, the inverse was uh, was also uh, ap ap applied with trans men, where there was an assumption that trans men uh, were, were at low risk based largely uh, on um, the issue of, of biological, um, a very biological uh, perspective around um, assuming who their partners are based on people's knowledge around sexual orientation, which normally in our context is conflated with gender identity and expression. So basically this meant that uh, trans men were very much invisibilized in the HIV response. And that is quite problematic, especially in a space where there's a lot of, 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 uh, of cultural um, informing of, of some patriarchal sets of, of our existence, our understanding of even gendering roles, uh, even in relation to uh, sex and sexuality, which is a, quite a privatized topic in our context. It's not really easy to speak on the topic. So when you have a population of people who um, already exist in a cultural setting where it's difficult to talk about sex, but on top of that, where there's many assumptions made about yourself and your your sexual uh, uh your sexuality and your and your sexual behavior, um, it it really leaves you uh at a very uh in a very vulnerable position because firstly, looking at the issue of condom use and the very basics, just the knowledge of how to use safety barrier methods it's quite difficult to even have a learning space because within the spaces that currently exist, there is nothing that speaks to you within your gender identity, having the very basic of knowledge on how to protect oneself. Secondly, um, the, the aspect of um, then assume partnership. So we have this model that we use uh, when we sensitize healthcare practitioners, and it's it speaks to the intersections of sexual relations within a sexual network of a of a trans man. So we call it the blind spot. So the blind spots being uh, all the other sexual partners that are assumed not to be sexual partners for trans men. The assumption is trans men uh, basically have sexual partners who are cisgender women. This has meant that where the partners are either cis men, uh, trans women, or the other diversity of these partners is excluded because of that assumption um, based on the lack of understanding around um, on gender identity and expression. So basically 
any sort of interventions um, around um, that kind of sexual activity do not exist. Uh, assumptions of trans men not engaging in penetrative sex. And I mean, specifically in, in our country, we lost two trans men um, just uh, last year who had uh, retracted from using um, their, their, their art. So that in and of itself uh, is an indicator that there is something inherently wrong with how the system perceives our risk as trans men. And then this also um, means that, and, and this is uh, cross-cutting uh, across countries in Southern Africa, where you find that in, invisibilization of our identities in, in terms of the response itself. So there's also an element where risk is compounded for some uh, within our setting, in a patriarchal setting, there's assumptions around the roles we should play when it comes to money and uh, the provision role that we play. So you find a lot of, of, of trans men do, um, and from a community where these people are disenfranchised, they do engage in transactional sex as a way of, of, of um, earning that income to fulfill those roles associated with um, being a provider. Where, where they can't make that money. So these are other aspects relating to that risk. And all this becomes uh, ignored in terms of um, ensuring interventions that actually work. Um, and most times, even in engaging with, uh, with healthcare, wealth, healthcare institutions, uh, at times because for, for those who do pass as, as male, it's very, very much ends up being a situation where any service offering that you will be offered um, at the point of, of entry into that space will particularly speak to, to cisgender men. Uh, we exist in healthcare spaces where there's very little knowledge around uh, transgender people and especially transgender men. So right now we sit at a position where uh, in our country we'll be doing another biobehavioral study. And once again, uh, it will include trans women and it will not include transgender men. So that means the data that we also need in terms to make an analysis of these interventions, um, it, it, it's, it's highly compromised. So we, we sit at a, a space where we need the data for the interventions to be carried forward, but at the same time being afforded the opportunity to go beyond um, even the qualitative aspects uh, and the quantitative data as well that we would need to craft the best kind of interventions. That's that's just a missing gap. So I think it's it's really a, a difficult position to be in. We have um, a few uh, organizations that have done mainly qualitative uh, studies around the difficulties, the social barriers in relation to being able to be communicative about uh, the sexual behaviors uh, within the transgender uh, uh, space, particularly for transgender men. And these interventions, it's few and far between. Many the organize the grassroots organizations are working on um, ensuring that they capture that qualitative aspect. But I think we still have a long way to go in terms of that inclusion and having uh, what we need to be able to cater for trans men. Thanks so much, Sam. Can you just briefly tell us a bit, because I know that this has had a big impact in Southern Africa and, and around the world, but how is the anti-gender and anti-human rights movement impacting on work with trans communities? So basically, um, we have this, I think, uh, weird relationship in terms of information and the global North and the global South, uh, where, there's a lot of a sense of information being taken in authority in terms of, um, of, of, of particular populations. Now, when you have um, a setting where the correct information, even around how we exist in pathology within, um, within our spaces, um, that, that minimal information where there's a lot of people who self-medicate uh, on hormonal therapy, uh, there's a lot of looking like people basically they service themselves in terms of their medical needs because that is an element that is not um, within the medical field taught because of, of the assumption of, 
uh, or the lack of visibility, should I say, of, of, of us as communities. So with these movements uh, arising, they are packaging information in all sorts of ways that then becomes the first ports of information that communities are receiving in terms of who we are before we even get a chance to articulate who we are, what our needs are, and the role that we play within wider society, um, there's already this sense of negativity that is being created in terms, not allowing us to have contextually specific information that, that enables people to get to know who we are. So already because uh, the anti-movement is so resourced as well, that means they are reaching a wide audience. At national levels, we are seeing um, the crafting of, of, of uh, uh, policies that directly impact on the work that is supposed to benefit our communities. So it's, 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 really, uh, it's really a frustrating uh, moment in life uh, because we were at this space where we're starting to negotiate for that working space. But uh, right now, this messaging is directly impacting on, um, on, on our ability to get the flow of the right information out to communities so that they can be able to support that in integration and ensure that within our diversity, we are able to contribute to the growth of our, our, our countries and our economies. Um, I think one of the impacts as well, you will look at uh, religion, the role that religion plays. We are very... Uh, spiritual nations, so to speak. And that comes in various forms, but over the years, um, particular messaging in relation to uh, demonizing uh, our existence has been on the rise. And there's a lot, the impact has been ranging from violence uh, and death in, in, some, in some cases of, 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 of transgender persons based on the way that these messages are crafted. Uh, in ways that we are not even alluding to our own indigenous knowledge of that diversity as it existed before. Um, mainly the, the authority of this conversation is being taken away from us speaking in relation to the reality of our existence in our context to this very same messaging that is most times misleading and inflammatory. So it's it's really been a, a, a strong hindrance to our work and a lot of people, the issue of having to migrate, it's it, it, it's rising, it's 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 really rising in Africa where people are having to 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 find themselves in a space where migration is the only choice that they have because the tension continues to to grow within the setting where they live. Thanks so much, Sam, and, and that I think has really set the context for why it was so important for the working group to develop a resource that could try to counter some of the misinformation that is out there. And I'm going to hand over to Seb now, if you can give us, please give us some background on why and how the policy brief was developed. Over to you, Seb. Thanks, Anil. Um, yeah, I can give a bit of that that process, uh, kind of building on what uh, Sam was saying, um, in terms of the rationale and the thinking behind why this policy brief is needed, um, connecting it to the global level, um, thinking about as we move towards the deadline for the 2025 global AIDS targets and towards the um, sustainable development goals as well in 2030. Um, we know there's a lack of progress, which is threatening to undermine um, those global HIV commitments. Um, and, the 2023 Global Aid, uh, AIDS update also puts us on track, um, though it puts us on track to come close to that 95% treatment and 95% viral suppression goals globally. The biggest gaps um, are highlighted as still remaining for marginalised and key populations. And um, trans men and trans masculine people, um, in particular, are one population who continue to receive that minimal attention in the global HIV response. Um, as a group we've not benefited equally. Um, we have the lowest global viral suppression uh, rates of all key populations in 2022 is at 44%. Um, highest HIV prevalence in all but two global regions. Um, and we also face, uh, as trans people more broadly, the highest burdens in relation to the 10-10-10 um, targets as well. And despite being trans people um, more broadly being a key population in practice, as we've said, transmasculine um, 
and uh, trans men and trans masculine people are excluded by mission across the HIV response because of these different issues. So the policy brief is about presenting a case for inclusion um, based on HIV prevalence data and evidence of that high unmet need. And in terms of the resource it's, itself, the policy brief um, is an advocacy resource. It's aimed at uh, national health policymakers, health officials uh, within ministries of health, technical specialists within global health bodies like the World Health Organization, UNAIDS, UNFPA. Um, it's targeted to donor organizations like the Global Fund, PEPFAR, and also international civil society organizations um, who are working in HIV or sexual reproductive health and rights. And it presents recent findings from uh, a range of sources. So in part, it's a response to the World Health Organization's um, consolidated guidelines on HIV, uh, hepatitis and STI uh, prevention, diagnosis, treatment and care for key populations. And um, that's the updated guidelines from 2022. Um, and it builds on arguments and evidence that has been gathered through uh, Gates Values and Preferences study um, and other sources uh, on HIV prevention, treatment um, and care, as well as academic and grey literature, clinical guidelines, technical briefs and uh, community evidence and resources and research as well. And it came together, um, it was developed with the guidance and leadership of the Trans Men and HIV Working Group, um, and it includes statements of impact from uh, different communities and individuals, which were gathered through um, a series of interviews and survey responses with key informants, as well as a focus group discussion. Um, and the process of kind of writing this has been very collaborative with lots of input and discussion within that working group as well. So hopefully that's a a succinct overview of kind of where this uh, brief is coming from. So it's a very succinct overview of what was in fact a very lengthy process, particularly because it was so participative. Um, thanks, Seb. Would you be able to now give us the main recommendations from the report? Yes, indeed I can. And, um, Yes, so I these these are all listed out and you can see them in the policy brief as well, but just to go through them, um, you know, clearly so that they're all here. Next slide, please. Um, and so the recommendations are broken down into those different audiences, which I just mentioned um, for ease of kind of finding uh, their targets, essentially. So the first group are for um, those technical bodies and, and teams within uh, the World Health Organization, UNAIDS, UNFPA. Um, and just to say that there were a range of kind of uh, spotlight issues and topics that came up in the policy brief and the recommendations um, work through these different areas, as well as key areas of um, the kind of um, the last fives, reaching the last fives in uh, service provision, reaching the 30, uh, 60, 80 targets and the 10, 10, 10 for kind of critical enablers in the a broader environment as well. So those are reflected through each of the recommendation uh, sections. So um, I'll go through these uh, as we flick through. So um, first recommendations for this audience are based on emerging HIV prevalence and risk data. Um, rec we recommend that these organizations institutionalize and explicitly identify trans men uh, and other uh, trans persons assigned female at birth um, within the key population of trans people um, so it's about specifically targeting and, and recognizing that differentiation and supporting this group within national HIV responses. Uh, the second recommendation is to provide technical support to facilitate that inclusion, um, particularly in national data collection efforts, um, specifically national health strategic plans and the design and delivery of interventions and the monitoring of these plans. Next slide, please. And uh, we'd also like to see increased technical support for trans-led service delivery in line with those 30, 60, 80 targets for community um, leadership on uh, design and delivery of uh, services and interventions. Um, addressing persistent violence against uh, trans persons and communities. So this is about supporting community-led monitoring and responses, um, ensuring preventive and treatment services for gender-based violence are trans-competent inclusive and sensitive. And what we mean by trans competent is um, a set of kind of clinical um, and cultural competencies which uh, make services 
acceptable, uh, available and accessible and of good quality um, as judged by trans masculine community. The next recommendation is uh, to issue firmer, issue firmer guidance that the provision of gender affirming care should be seen as a critical sexual and reproductive health intervention. This is really one of the main priorities that came up um, as we were pulling this resource together. And that integration of HIV services into broader sexual and reproductive health services, which includes gender affirming care, um, may be the only way that trans masculine people um, and trans people more broadly can access HIV services. Next slide, please. Um, in developing and update in uh, developing and updating uh, guidelines, incorporate trans competent, competent care principles um, in line with guidance uh, that was developed with the trans community um, and those technical bodies. Um, and it's called the transit implementation tool and ensure that clear pathways between all aspects of uh, health and social care are put in place in line with those uh, principles. We also recommend uh, that these bodies develop technical guidance for integrating HIV and STI testing into gender affirming care as an access point for regular testing, uh, where for instance, blood work is being done um, already for hormone uh, levels, et cetera, um, and strengthen the provision of gender affirming care within HIV and sexual reproductive health services. Uh, the next one is ensuring that existing guidance um, from the transit guidelines that condom compatible lubricants be given together with condoms is followed. Um, this guidance already exists, but we found in practice this is not being implemented uh, in accordance with those guidelines. Next slide, please. Um, there's a need to provide more explicit guidelines on provision of uh, condom compatible lubricants. So the emphasis is on lubricants here. Um, for trans men and trans masculine people um, who are having vaginal or frontal as well as anal sex um, with all sexual penetrative partners and not only with cis men. In practice, uh, we found that there's provision of condoms, um, but rarely lubricants together with condoms, which is especially important for um, people who are taking testosterone who might have uh, vaginal or frontal atrophy as well. Um, the next recommendation is, is to drive better uptake into national clinical guidance that trans men and other uh, trans masculine and other uh, trans persons assigned female at birth are eligible for PrEP, which is already outlined in the WHO consolidated guidelines, um, but not being taken up into that national practice. And finally, uh, the World Health Organization as the health cluster lead, um, this is in terms of responding to crises and emergencies must ensure that implementation of the minimum initial service package for sexual and reproductive health in crises, so that's the MISP, um, is, includes provision for trans men and trans masculine people and other trans persons assigned female at birth. Um, so to ensure the inclusion in these kind of crisis response within the mission, minimum initial service package. Next slide, please. Um, so we move on now to um, the next group of actors, which is donors. And uh, we know in general that the HIV response for all trans persons is underfunded um, and resourcing must be accessible and available for use in core costs, community-led emergency response and interventions, community-based outreach and advocacy and peer-led service provision and research. And more specifically, uh, donors should allocate specific funding to HIV responses for trans persons, including trans men and trans masculine people, as well as specifically for trans women. So we're not talking about wanting di to divert funds away from uh, that are already allocated or kind of meant for trans women. This is about um, bringing additional funding and specificity. The second recommendation is to increase resourcing for trans men and trans masculine people uh, for community-led empowerment interventions, including outreach, peer-led services, advocacy, awareness raising, capacity strengthening and resource mobilization, as well as, um, this is quite specifically a priority, um, formal testing and self-testing as well, which is uh, came up as being more accessible and more needed. Um, the next recommendation is to ensure that partner implemented HIV programs and services are meeting the needs of trans men and trans masculine people. Um, and again, integrating those trans competent care principles. Next slide, please. The next recommendation is um, to ensure that trans men and trans masculine people are included in uh, IBBS surveys and research 
um, so that national strategic plans are informed from accurate data, which is disaggregated, um, and that national resource allocation based off of this data is um, accurate, essentially. Um, and this was an issue that continued to come up in uh, multiple countries, this issue of exclusion, and as Sam described, uh, for South Africa as well. We also recommend um, the, the, the donors recognize and resource the inclusion of trans men and trans masculine people as professionals in, in research, line, res, research leadership design and implementation um, across data collection and dissemination, um, and not just as uh, community members. Uh, we recommend that donors work closely with human rights institutions and communities uh, to leverage their influence in driving legal and policy reform these being one of the remaining and continued major barriers um, to realizing human rights in many contexts. Next slide, please. We uh, recommend that donors support and resource communities encountering the anti-gender movement or sometimes called the anti-trans movement and other drivers of violence, discrimination, and stigma. Um, we recommend the, uh, investing in trans-led community systems to build resilience and specifically disaster risk management capacities um, and community-based cap uh, capacity strengthening um, in light of ongoing and sustained and future crises. The final recommendation for donors is to ensure technical and financial support is available um, to access sexual and reproductive health services that is gender affirming um, as well as uh, accessing general health services as part of the minimum initial service package uh, and as part of the minimum initial service package during crises. Then the third group of recommendations is for national health policymakers and ministries of health. And um, there's a specific recommendation here about the, is the new coding system, which uh, depathologizes um, gender dysphoria as a mental health condition and instead um uh i can't remember the, the new definition of it but uh, um implementing that new definition which is depathologizing um within national health provision and policies monitoring and reporting mechanisms and integrating those changes into national health insurance or national health um, coverage schemes the, we also recommend removing laws that criminalize uh, trans men and trans masculine people um, and provide HIV related legal services for people seeking protection, as well as uh, providing redress for human rights violations. We recommend implementing legal gender recognition frameworks that are fast accessible, transparent, and importantly, based on self-determination as an absolute priority um, that was repeatedly raised um, across by multiple people and across multiple sources. Next slide, please. We also uh, recommend that um, these bodies recognize human rights as a critical component of effective health responses. Um, so ensuring that health policy and implementation are inclusive and based on human rights. We recommend that trans men and trans masculine people are explicitly included in definitions of trans persons as a key population in national strategic plans and national HIV and STI responses. We recommend that meaningful engagement of um, trans men and trans masculine people is increased in all decision making boards, panels, advisory committees um, as a systematic way to ensure this um, and that the risks our community are facing and our specific vulnerabilities are taken into account. Um, we recommend addressing structural barriers as well as the affordability, availability um, and informational barriers uh, that prevent, uh, so in order to increase testing, access to PrEP and other prevention uptake and adherence. Next slide, please. Um, there's a need to collect disaggregated HIV surveillance data um, led by government and ministries of health um, in line with the HIV prevention uh, 2025 roadmap 10 point action plan. Um, governments and ministries of health should also ensure that national health service packages and medical insurance schemes uh, include gender affirming care, going back to this being a priority issue and potentially sole access point for HIV care as well. Um, we recommend safe access to hormones and regular blood monitoring um, alongside evidence based information 
uh, we found that there was a lot of uh, kind of myths and um, confusion or lack of information around uh, interaction between antiretrovirals, PrEP and hormones. So there's a need to address this um, within this recommendation as well. Next slide, please. Um, and related to this one, I've skipped ahead. Um, so specifically to provide evidence-based information and education around this myth, um, based on the evidence that there is no adverse interaction between ARVs, PrEP and masculinizing hormones. Uh, we recommend expanding partnerships and resources to translate organizations uh, to deliver HIV prevention, testing and uh, linking to treatment services. Um, there's a need for healthcare worker education and training uh, to establish that transclinical and cultural uh, competence principles. And we recommend introducing stronger accountability mechanisms um, for health and social care providers to reduce stigmatizing and discriminatory behaviors. We found that this is broadly recognized and appreciated, but the lack of kind of implementation um, and support for this to happen at the national level. Next slide, please. And the last set of recommendations for this um, group. Oh, we might have, have we skipped one? All right. No, okay. Um, so the last set of recommendations is for, yeah, that's okay. Next, thank you. Is for um, international civil society organizations. And uh, we recommend support to training um, on trans men and trans masculine people's uh, so uh, SOGS, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, and sex characteristics. Um, what our specific health needs and vulnerabilities and risks are. Um, and this training should ideally target healthcare providers, um, key population focal points, LGBT plus organizations, researchers, policymakers, um, to try and embed and support that transclinical and transcultural competence um, at both national levels and clinical provider levels. Um, we recommend supporting uh, awareness campaigns targeting the community of trans men and trans masculine people um, to address some of those myths around sexual behaviours and educating on um, prevention uh, that's specifically tailored to our, our communities. Next slide, please. Um, we recommend strengthening capacity for community-led monitoring, um, specifically for human rights abuses and around barriers to accessing services. We recommend providing technical and financial support for that community-led monitoring and support to strengthen trans person-led advocacy, specifically around de decriminalization and for addressing those structural changes um, to reduce vulnerability and risks. Um, we recommend increasing support for out of school sexuality education, including that which is delivered by trans led community organizations um, to address uh, issues of self stigma, particularly in young trans persons, and increase their knowledge and skills. And lastly, um, on the next slide, please. I think, oh, that is the last one. Sorry, yeah, that's the last one. Um, so I hope that that is. Uh, a good summary and a little bit of background information to where those recommendations came from. So Anil, I'll pass back to you. So thank you so much, Seb, and you did a brilliant job with summarizing um, a lot of information. Um, and just to say, we've had a couple of um, questions in the Q&A asking if we're going to make the presentation available afterwards. Yes, we're going to make the presentations avail available afterwards. Um, we will be sending it out to all the participants, but also to say that the um, all of those recommendations and the thinking behind them and, and a lot more detail is contained in the policy brief. And we're also going to be sharing the link for that. It's it's We've put it in the chat and we'll share it once again for those who've joined subsequently. Um, and that's where a lot of the information that Seb has been talking to now will be found in a lot more detail. And thanks so much for that, Seb. That was really great. Um, I've got, we've got um, our colleague Anwar who has been monitoring the Q&A and I'm gonna just check in with Anwar on if there are any questions from the participants that you could read out to us. Hi everyone, I'm Anwar here, a Gates Movement Building Lead. Yes, we have, we have a couple of questions. Thank you for, for those who shared. So one question, first, thank you so much for this important resource. And the question is, uh, were there discussion on including or reaching the sexual partners of trans men or other 
AFAB trans people. It wasn't directed to anyone particularly, so whoever feel, uh, feels like taking it, go ahead. Um, I can answer, and then if anyone else wants to add in. Um, hi, Sally. Um, yes, there was, and um, this came up in like a fair bit of the uh, academic research as well as within the, the group and from kind of community input, um, both on the kind of uh, those assumptions that Sam mentioned already of uh, that trans men only sleep with cis women um, and that exclusion from uh, particularly trying to access services as men who have sex with men um, and those negative assumptions of providers that you know trans men can't be gay or can't be bisexual um, meant that they're being excluded so this impacted you know access to condoms and access to lubricants as well um, there's also very little around um, uh, kind of other partners as well and for instance trans men and trans masculine people who might be having sex with trans women um, and the kind of lack of research around that but there was also a lot of um, kind of negative treatment from uh, cis men that came up and the need to reach uh, the cis men who have sex with men communities with um, education around risk and um, tackling kind of transphobia as well and negative treatment which kind of creates a power imbalance um, as well that was described quite often um, which then impacts kind of um, abilities to consent and uh, you know have in place the HIV prevention measures that you want to use. Back to you Anwar. Thanks um, Seb. So I'm just going to read um, out the second question and I see new people are um, asking new questions so feel very free. So the next question will be are there guidelines or models for data systems and data collections? We have been pushing PEPFAR on disaggregated data collection that's inclusive of trans men and they drag their feet on requiring it of their implementers. Maybe, maybe I can, Go I ahead. can try, yes, I can try to not to respond directly, but to comment that uh, uh, UNAID uh, relies on countries to provide the data that UNAID use to launch every year what we call the Global AIDS Monitoring Report that brings all the collection of data uh, about the HIV epidemic and HIV response. Uh, in all the indicators related to transgender people, UNAIDS ask, asks countries to disaggregate this data by gender, so providing uh, information about transgender women, transgender men, and there is an option transgender other. Uh, unfortunately, as I have uh, indicated in my presentation, only a few countries yet are responding, providing disaggregated data. And uh, so I think the, the, there is an important recommendation that I, yeah, I definitely take note and we'll discuss internally uh, at UNAIDS uh, that uh, Seb uh, mentioned on how we can maybe provide and support countries uh, uh, support, provide technical support to countries so they can collect more data uh, that is disaggregated. Uh, definitely, this is something that uh, I will discuss with our uh, data for impact team on how to respond. And I can also check what are the current uh, guidances that uh, UNAIDS provides to countries when we ask for them to provide this disaggregated data. Over. Thanks so much, Clayton. I'm not sure if anyone else has got anything to add on that question. Go ahead, Seb. I was just going to add, not necessarily answer, I was thinking maybe the transit guidance uh, guidelines do have advice on this, but I'll have to double check back. But just to say that um, this instance, what you describe of um, pushing PEPFAR to like implement that disaggregated data to require it has been came up several times um, when we're pulling together this resource and actually cases of uh, PEPFAR uh, telling people not to disaggregate data 
um, which was interesting. So it, yeah, it seems like there's a bit of a trend there and maybe a conversation to have. And just to say that there are some best practices, there are some studies that have been done that provide some indications of, of what might be useful participatory community-led methodologies, and we would be happy to share those resources as well. Can I hand back to you, Anwar, for the next question? So next question would be, how do we use this data? So that was while you said we're talking. So how do we use this data to promote better healthcare for pregnant non-binary slash non-binary people slash trans men? Okay, so uh, I think basically to have this data immediately, um, it, it sets the setting in terms of our, our understanding of in the first place, um, uh, giving, um, ensuring that we understand that trans men are having uh, sex with various uh, uh, kinds of partners across the board. And once this acknowledgement is there, it gives space and room to start even having those conversations around how best to be able to provide the kind of, of care that is needed. Uh, I mean, when we, we're speaking in terms of HIV, but I think it also stretches to uh, mostly the service packages relate to issues around uh, reproductive health. Um, it encompasses many things around even when we look at uh, cancer screening, um, which a, a lot of trans persons, be it prostate or, or cervical cancer and the likes, do not really participate in these processes because of the nature of how they are gendered. So once we have um, this data, it then gets us to have that, that conversation as to Firstly, ad admitting to the fact that the sexual partners are varied, but then also being able to tailor the spaces that we are accessing uh, these services from to be able then to, to really speak to those particular needs across the board, also linking to, to HIV, but the other varied components like reproductive health and cancer screening, as I had mentioned. Thanks so much, Sam. Do we have any other questions, Anwar? Yeah, we have actually a couple of them. So another one would be, um, so in, oops, sorry, I did something wrong there. In higher education, we see many new students coming in who have not had access to comprehensive SR, SRH education. How do you recommend reaching these needs in the context of trans men, non-binary folks who have disabilities, how do we keep this report accessible? Not sure if who would want to have a go at that. Okay, I, I was speaking from our particular context where I think the challenge is also around even looking at the, the anti-movements as we spoke of. Their main, one of their main points of of selling their messages around um, the issue of, of children and young persons. And for many of us living in criminalized contexts, that simply already means that being able to, to cater for a response that speaks to younger trans persons, it, it, it's very much of a challenge. So I think the issue of, of, um, of criminality has to be looked into. Uh, we look at the wider uh, operating environment in terms of the policy change that needs to happen that that gets we get to a point that decriminalizes us then uh, enabling us to be able then to look at what comprehensive sexuality education would look like and i agree this is uh, also a, another gap in relation to uh, trans and, and non binary persons trans masculine non binary persons in relation to um uh, for, for varied aspects and, and people with disabilities. So there, there is a, a, a lot that needs to be done, but I think also taking into account the operating environments in different settings, uh, particularly ours, that challenge around criminality is one of the issues that really needs to be tackled in order for us to be able to, to look at our comprehensive sexuality education. And yeah, with that challenge in the face of the messaging of the anti-movement, being mainly around children in terms of how they are op opposing our work. Yeah. 
Thanks so much, Sam. I also wanted to say in, in follow-up, um, I'm seeing that there's also questions for like information on very specific country contexts and, and people are welcome, very welcome um, to contact me directly and, and we can put them in touch with organizations in their local context. Um, but in terms of resources and information, just to let you know that um, the policy brief is just one of the resources we've got available. We've also got a fact sheet that is available, which is intended as a more um, user-friendly resource for um, uh, information sharing within the trans and gender diverse community and the broader LGBTQI community. Um, and that's a resource that's available. It's available on the same link that we're sharing for the policy brief, but also on the GATE website. If you look um, on, on our website under the trans, um, the, the trans men and HIV working group, we've got a page um, of resources and, and a lot of it is specifically on um, sexual and reproductive health resources that has been put together by, over the years by the uh, working group members. And that's a repository of information that might also be helpful in, in, in people's uh, different contexts. I see we're running very short on time. Anwar, do we have any last questions? I think one last question, and we might want to just close question from now on. So thank you for the very final question. So um, Eastgate and this working group looking on doing same and other SRHR researches in other regions that do not have these findings and also lack HIV implementation targeting transgender people in their regions. So, so I think it's a question I think for the broader working group. Um, I can say that the what we're intending to do now is support organizations that and, and activists in their local context to make use of the resource um, and look at how we can assist them. And then I think the working group is also a forum where we can identify specific needs in particular regions and look at what additional resources might we need we need to might we might need to develop in the future going forward. Um, and that and I think that that's something that we can definitely have a look at. I know that increasingly, and, and Sam was talking about the context with the anti-human rights movement, increasingly sexual and reproductive health rights are being targeted uh, also by the anti-rights movement. And I think it's really important for us to be finding these synergies and looking at how we can work together on access to sexual and reproductive health rights that is inclusive of all communities and making sure that those rights continue to be available for everyone. Um, and I think that that's definitely something that the working group can potentially look at going forward. Um, but I think we've come to the end now. I I really wish that we could take more questions. For those of you who've got unanswered questions, please feel free to email them to us and we will put you in contact with whoever can answer that question best. I just want to, as we close, do a couple of very, very quick thank yous. I'd like to thank Clayton, Sam, and Seb for the expertise and insights that they shared today. It was really invaluable. Thanks, additional thanks to Seb and the Trans Men and HIV Working Group who contributed to creating these resources, and also to the UNAIDS and UNFPA technical teams who reviewed the document. Thank you to our Executive Director, Erica, for her unwavering support and leadership and also to our fantastic GATE comms team, Navon and Andreo, who did really heroic work behind the scenes in putting the webinar together and making sure that the documentation was ready on time. And lastly, thank you to all of you who joined us today. We really appreciate your time. Uh, please take care and stay safe wherever you are. Thank you. <laughs>